I mean, first off, how you been? Everything has collapsed. It's really a sense of guilt in me, you know, why I've had too many blessings. Um, and who can, I can't really say I've done a whole lot with them. In the grand scheme of things, I haven't done much. The only thing I've really done, if at all, is shown that there can be kindness, caring, and empathy in the depths of misery. So I wasn't always miserable. Now, I mean, I've had I had my time when I was doing really well, and all the women liked me. I had three dollars in my pocket. Um, other than being short, men wanted to be me. I really was that guy for a minute, but eventually everything caught up. You and think that shifted it, at some point? Was there a, a palpable shift or was it? It was somewhat gradual. Um, I think the, the the main thing that happened was when I broke up with my last girlfriend, I was with her for like eight years. So when we broke up, a lot changed. Because one of the things I realized was that in that eight year span, I went from, I think, 39 to 46 or something like that. And that youthfulness, I mean, 39 is not youthful or 38, but there was a certain youthfulness still there. There was a, a certain I could connect to the younger generation. I could still be considered the younger generation. I was 39, but I could still pass with 32, 31. And I could still live that life. And, and people would look at me and, and still give me jobs that they give 20 year olds because I'm, I'm that strong. People still had hope. I became old overnight. Um, and I started realizing that all of the dreams that I had, that I used as sort of carrots, to get me through, um, we're never gonna come true. And the realization that they literally can't come true hit me hard. You know, what's really the point? You know, I'm not gonna write the great American novel. I was a gifted writer. I was considered one of the best new writers in America. I don't write anymore. I had scholarships to call or offers for wrestling. I didn't make it to college. I made the national team in Sambo never competed once i was in the military basically got kicked out twice actually why don't um, you write anymore I keep telling myself i will i was going to do an autobiography but it was so so complicated it's trying to, it's just so much trying to compress the one thing like i started it and had like the first five pages and then i had this novel that i've had on my mind for years if i survive which I don't know that I am because honestly, right now, um, I'm at the very bottom. Trail is gone. Puck's probably going to be gone. And I'm, in a, I'm in a cat hoarder's house. You're in a cat hoarder's house? I don't know if you remember that old lady I would help who, hoard, who, was, a, who was a hoarder. Yeah. I'm, I'm in a room in her house right now. So she took you in? Yeah. At least you're someplace safe. Yeah. Craziness plus craziness is probably not a good idea. I, I've had to temper myself some because she, she does some things that I'm like, oh. but I've also noticed that she's been incredibly patient with me as well. So it's like, she's, I mean, she didn't have, doesn't have to have me here. You know, I, I give her some money. I buy her dinner when I can. I, you know, do what little I can, but. You know, it's not enough to have someone stay. And she doesn't have to do that. And she does it. And, and I'm incredibly grateful. But and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get my truck fixed or not. If I can get it fixed. And if I can somehow avoid it being repossessed this month, then I can tell myself I can climb back. I can tell myself if it doesn't get repossessed, if I make it through this payment, I don't, it doesn't get repossessed. If a miracle happens and I get to pay insurance and I get it fixed, then I can I can go out, not make money like I used to, but go out and do something. Go out and, and call, call, you know, before I walk. I can do that. I can find a way to survive. I can find a way to make it back. 
I can make it there. I just don't know if I will. Honestly, I don't want to. And the reason I know I can make it back is because God loves me for some reason. And I know who I am. I know that for whatever reason, I overcome until I don't, I guess, right? From the Redacted Podcast, I'm Matt Bender, and this is Murdering Malachi, Episode 7, Eventually Everything Caught Up. What makes old age so sad is not that our joy, but rather our hope ceases. That's a quote from a German author named John Paul, who lived in the 16th and 17th century. What Malachi just described is a very understandable feeling with many, reaching that point in your life when your age catches up to you, and the sudden realization that you're not that young anymore. The dreams you once had and always thought you had more time to accomplish, now seem unattainable. You could almost call it a midlife crisis, I guess. That's a tough period in life for a lot of people, and we usually associate it with some 55-year-old guy going out and buying a new wardrobe and a sports car. But what happens when you find yourself at that age and with that same feeling and you have nothing? No 401k, no health insurance, no house, no family. To say that must be tough is kind of an understatement. So the last time we really interviewed was was probably, yeah, two months ago, two and a half months ago. So, you know, what's been going on since then? So I don't know if this, no, I was in the hospital. I think that happened afterwards. So I think, yeah, I think that was three weeks ago. So I've had 15 surgeries in my life, all sorts of random stuff. I've had a broken back where they weren't sure I was going to walk again. I mean, I mean, I've, I've, I've lived life. I partied way too hard. I've worked way too hard. You know, I've lived. But this recent, and I had two surgeries last year for my wrist and my elbow from bad nerve damage so you know i'm 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 living but just recently i had the absolute worst experience it's it's near the top of the list of worst medical experiences a man can go through and before i tell you what it is i've actually had nurses who were there and we talked about it and they were like, wow, we can't use the giving birth excuse on you. You know, that whole, man, you'll never understand the pain of, hey, they laugh yeah. about it. They're like, they're like, darn it. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're the one man we can't use that excuse on. So it was kind of a running joke with the nurses in the hospital that, that I, I cracked the code. <laughs> I cracked <laughs> you the, cheated the system. Yeah, I cheated the system. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> That's a good one. So if you are a male, and I'm saying biologically, you know, identify whoever you want, that's your choice, but you need certain body parts for this next comment. If you are biologically a male, it, we're going to do a trigger warning because you might, you might need a chamomile tea or a beer after hearing this. Oh, so, God. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Here's the story very quickly. I'm in a camper in Florida on the farm and I'm starting to get infested with like roaches and other little like, wood eating bugs. And, you know, I started noticing like, yeah, this ain't good. And I would spray, but then they come back. Cause you know, they just go out into the grass and then come back later. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't filthy, but you know, things happen, especially when you live out in the woods. So me and, me and stinkers, um, she was a uh, tethered outside, like a, 30 foot leash safe, you know, she gets to run around the grass. And I left 
for the day. When I left for the day, I did one of those raid uh, bombs, boggers. Came back like 10 hours later and you know, didn't think much of it. Took my little outside shower. It's Florida in a camper, you know, in the back of a farm. So basically alone. So, you know, I lay down naked on the bed, just cooling off. After a little while, I started noticing, um, we're, we're going to refer to them as my ping pongs. Um, we can guess what part of the male genitalia that is. After a while, my ping pongs started stinging. I was like, what is that? And, you know, I didn't, uh, being a dude who's had every pain known to man and every damn near every injury, I just was like, well, we'll see if it goes away. A few hours later, it's like, starting to really sting. Like, whoa, okay, okay, it, this ain't good. So then I'm like, well, we're definitely going to see something about this if, we just, if this doesn't change by the morning. It's like seven or eight at night. Maybe an hour or two later, it was on fire. It was like someone literally had an open flame for my ping pongs. I got in the car, barely drove. I, I mean, it was those, just seeing me try to uh, drive a car while avoiding touching my ping pongs to anything, I'm dressed, was a nightmare. Got to the emergency room, and at this point, I couldn't sit down. I couldn't do anything. They just took me immediately to the back. I wasn't on the bed. I was on the floor in like this weird praying position with my legs wide open. So nothing's touching nothing for like five hours. Like literally just crouched on the floor, not moving for like five hours. And they eventually gave me all these different MRIs. And, and when they gave me a sonogram, oh, dear God, oh, dear God, I'm screaming because, you know, they got to rub it with the, oh, Lord. They didn't know what was going on. Everybody was perplexed. Who is this guy just in this horrific pain? And they ambulance came and took me to a bigger hospital, like the hospital for the area. Like, this is where you go when you're in trouble. And they took me in, and same thing. I'm I'm on the floor, I think, for like eight hours, eight, eight to ten hours in, in, in crouching position. At this point, my legs are going numb. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just, it, this is like, I'm I'm just... Where are we going to go from here? What's happening? It's probably being in a crouch position for like 10 hours straight. Not not fun. So they came in. They didn't know what was going on. So they're like, we're just going to take you to surgery. We think maybe your, your testes are tied up. We don't, we don't know what's happening. And I think by the time they were ready to take the surgery, I was kind of able to lay down in like this weird position because my legs couldn't hold me anymore. And I found a way to like lay down with one leg up, like like almost like I'm in a in a gynecologist stirrup, but I, I unable to move at all. Like any movement at all was just this horrific pain. Finally, the surgeon they took me to surgery. The surgeon came back, and I think it was two of them. I've learned from experience: anytime two doctors come into a room, you're in trouble. They always come with reinforcements. If if they've got some news to tell you. The doctor comes in and she says, so um, this is what happened. I'm like, uh-huh. We were about to perform a surgery. About to? We were about to perform a surgery when we noticed the skin was falling off your ping pong right in front of us. Oh, jeez. Sorry, what? Yeah, like, I was oh, like, what? shit. So we're trying to figure out what it was, and no one can. And I eventually thought back to the rope to the rope auger. It must have seeped into the linen, which I did not cover, didn't even think about covering. So I had a pure chemical burn on my ping pongs and part of my penis where all the skin was gone. Now, holy shit. I don't know for if people who are unaware of this. I know it very well from my burns because I've had like eight skin graft surgeries for burns. I, I told you I've lived it. Um, but when you have no skin, that is completely open nerve ending. On top of it being on the ping pongs, which is the single most sensitive. Well, we all know just tap. Tap your man's ping pong very lightly and see how he reacts. 
Lord Jesus, I was what I call pain paralyzed for like three days. My upper body could move a little. I could not move. I just laid there, my legs open. When they went to change or do anything or when they came to look at it, I was just screaming, screaming. And, and I'm a dude who has a high pain tolerance. Again, 16 surgeries, eight skin grafts, you know, I've been through some things. I'm not your typical man where it's like, baby, I've got a cold. I'm going to die. You know, I'm the guy that goes in the hospital and they're like, did you know this is also broken? Oh, it is? When did I do that? You know, I'm that guy. So for me to be screaming, I mean, screaming up and down. They knew me. They had to come and like, can you stop screaming? Can you give me a new pair of nuts? You know, <laughs> you know. I had become known in that hospital. I mean, so yeah, it they had me on morphine, oxycontin, and some other one that caught that starts with a D. I mean, it 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 was the single most pain I'd ever felt. I was laying there thinking to myself, I was like, you know, praying to God, like. It, it, like just kill me now. I think a couple points. I was like, just kill me now. It ended. I'm good. I'm done. Just kill me now. And the other time that I was like, I was trying to be more productive, and I was like, it can't last forever. You know, I just got no on so it it can't last forever. You know, it has. It will get better. And I just kept holding on to the thought of just get through it. It can't last forever. It's only temporary. It's only temporary. So yeah, for the first three days, I was right there, just a zombie. It it kind of it healed actually pretty fast. I was only in there for like a week, um, and they were like, you know, you can go. But it was weird. Like I once I started healing, because of the nature of who I am, you know, being Gen X, you know, you know we can we can pick up our arm and carry it. To the doctors and be like, hey, can you sew this back on? Because I'm I'm that tight. Once it started healing and I I was able to get up and kind of walk, um, which was a monumental task. But once I kind of was able to walk, it started healing faster. And they're like, well, you know, you can go. Uh just you know, take care of yourself, be careful, don't do anything, you know, continue resting for another week or two. But once I got back, the, the crazy pharma later basically had evicted me while I was paralyzed in, in the hospital. And I was able to make arrangements for someone to move my trailer to some veteran's yard. You know, I rent some space for him, but it was trashed out. It had needed to be cleaned and sanitized from whatever bug spray remnant was left. It was just a horrible, horrible ordeal. A local animal rescuer had taken stinkers while I was in the hospital, so stinkers were safe. But when I got out and I went back to the trailer, I couldn't live in it. And I, I, I did not have the physical ability to clean it or do anything. So I slept in my car for three days. At the end of that three days, I was, I was back in the emergency room. Same pain, same hospital, the whole rigor remote and First, they're like, well, what's because it wasn't the same doctor. What's going on? You know, why are you hurting? They didn't know what was going on. It looked weird. And then I think they, they, somebody was like, oh, wait, we remember him. And they sent me back to the big hospital, back to the big hospital. Same surgeon came in and I explained to her that, you know, I was not able, I was not in a position to do any staying still, you know, like a normal human being, lay down in a bed and watch TV that I, I'm sleeping in a car, surviving. And basically what happened was that uh, I caught an infection because it wasn't totally, it was healed enough to go home, but it wasn't healed. So here I am with skin regrowing on my ping pongs, and that skin is now swollen and infected. So needless to say, it was massive pain again. So I'm in hospital for like another week and a half or something like that. And then finally... I get released from the hospital and I, I'm unable to do anything. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my trailer for days. I think I, I rested and moved it somewhere. And that was just sort of the catalyst for just the fall. It just, it went downhill from there. But that in and of itself 
from all the hospital stays I've had, from all the multiple injuries I've had, from, from the self-inflicted wounds I've had, it, it's just, that was absolute ninth or third circle of hell type of pain. I don't know that I wish that on my worst enemy. Like, you, you'd have to do something to my daughter if I had one. You know what I mean? Something bad for me to want to wish that kind of pain on any human being. Are you kind of healed up now? Well, I'm healed um, because that's what I do. Yeah. It's still, it's still sort of grown. Like I've got to be aware, which I'm, I'm a clean person anyway, but I've really got to be extra aware of like, okay, it's a really hot day. Let me take that extra, you know, sour. Let me take that extra thing. Let me um, not wear something that's going to cause them to, you know, rub up against me. Like, I've just got to be aware that they are extra sensitive now. You know, they're already, it's, it's already an area. Like, if you're a, you know, self aware human being, it's your generals. You already want to be, you know, a, a lot of people don't, the stripper, trust me, I know. Um, you'd be surprised who doesn't take care of their generals. But a normal, healthy, self-aware human being is already sort of extra aware of their generals. But now I have to be extra, extra aware. But all in all, um, it's healthy. It's more along the lines of just the uh, snowball effect it created on my life in general. Yeah, You know, being evicted by the crazy lady while who does that? While someone's paralyzed in the hospital because your bipolar mental ass is telling you that they're stalking you. I, it's just it was just craziness, you know? Like I said, her her boyfriend who was the actual landowner told me that he hid all of his guns. He, he's so but it's a snowball effect. I just started losing everything. Um I started so you don't have your trailer anymore, and you don't the trailer, have the space to put it on, even if you did. No, the trailer got repossessed because I, I could no longer keep up with the payments. Yeah, The jobs I used to get are not hiring me anymore. You know, no matter how bad life goes, I could always just go get hired by a moving company and, you know, make a few hundred or whatever. I could always go unload a cargo ship. I could always, you know, no matter how bad life got, during the bad times, um, I knew my one saving grace is that I'm Hercules, you know, and I could always go out. There were times I'd make some really good money just because they had a really, really strong guy who knew what he was doing, who, who wasn't just strong, but knew how to use it. You know, there were a couple of times I made like 50 bucks an hour because I would get like a job on state property or on like government property just doing manual labor. But because I was trustworthy and strong, you know, I could get those. I just got turned down for the first time in my life uh, recently by a moving company. And it's like, they're right. I think two of them did. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, that's my safety net. I guess, you know, being 54, they're just like, no. You know, you can look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you're 54. We're going to give this job to the 20 year old. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and that's I mean, just, the, your healing probably, that's not the best to be doing while you're healing either, I'm sure. Oh, no, the doctors told me I should not be doing that stuff anymore. Getting, getting sweaty, lifting. Well, that, and remember, I had two surgeries on my, uh, I had surgery on my elbow and my wrist yeah. last year where, I don't know if I told you this, but when I walked into the doctor's office um, and I told them I had a, uh, 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 cubital, uh, cubital, uh, whatever it is, uh, it's cubital, cubital syndrome. Tunnel. Yeah, cubital tunnel syndrome, yeah. uh, which is not a common thing. And they thought, like, oh, you know, you've read too many goop, and I'm like, no, dude. So they gave me the test, and they were like, holy crap, you're right. Like, no one even knows what this is, let alone knows they have it. But then he looked at me and was like, but how do you not also know? You have carpal tunnel syndrome in both wrists, and you have a pinched nerve on both sides of your neck. Like, 
this our our machine lit up like a Christmas. We ne- we didn't even know these lights lit up until we we attached it to you. And so they're like, first of all, how do you not know you you have the uh, all this going on? And second of all, whatever you're doing, if you continue, you'll be crippled by sixty. Like, you just we can't believe you're walking now. We can't believe you don't know that this this much damage is going on. I'm like, you know, I'm generation next. It is what it is. I'm just an old coot who's lived life. <laughs> but they 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 made it plain that yeah, well, you're not gonna have much life to live if you whatever it was you're doing. That, um, well, I think you can der- damage those nerves so badly that they just. I think you can get paralysis or something from that, like yeah, in yeah. in those limbs. Definitely, my hand yeah. for like six months had pins and needles in my hand for six months straight, twenty four hours a day. I almost went insane. I literally, it was like three o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep because my hand is getting, my hand is being attacked by a thousand little pins. I mean, it's just like, you know, Chinese water torture. One drop feels like nothing, but a thousand for six months straight, dude. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah well, it's just was... mentally draining, too, yeah, Sorry. besides the pain. Like, you could handle it for a little while, but that's a long time to have that. Non-stop. It's yeah. like, can you please just stop? And so, and they were like, they with my nerve and the cubital tunnel syndrome, for those who don't know, that's your funny bone nerve. And they said they didn't even know, because when they opened up my arm, they said they had never seen one that far over like it goes up the side of the inside of your elbow they said mine was almost on the other side of my arm they said they didn't even know if they could fix it like they'd never seen one that bad but it's good now but you got to be careful with it It, it, and that's the miracle of and you know people want to hear this or not but i'll say that's the miracle of a little bit of jesus in my life yeah is that no huh no i just said yeah Oh, I was like, hold up now. You don't know. No, the, the, yeah. <laughs> What's the miracle of Jesus in your life? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was like, wait a minute now. We might have to have a fight on this one. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a standard Christian, so don't put me in a category of those idiots. I'm just a follower of Jesus. We're a whole different breed. Uh, I get of, it. I get it. You know, we, a lot of us followers of Christ don't exist anymore because we actually believe in love and kindness and not judging. We don't believe in in like supporting you in, you know, self-destructive or sinful ways. Like, you're yeah, going to be a crackhead. We still love you. You know, go ahead and sleep with a thousand people at night and catch every disease on the man. We still love you. No, but we're just like, look, baby, we love you, but you might want to look at what you're doing. That's the kind, you, you feel me? So, anywho, there are so many things that have had, could have had me crippled for life already. So many things that could have me, you know, walking like Igor, the fact that I'm basically a functioning man, the fact that I can still fight off a mugger and protect an old lady, you know, I, I might end up in the hospital in two weeks now. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to recover too quick. But the fact that I can still protect the vulnerable, the fact that I can still walk upright is nothing sort of a miracle. But there's also the reality that I roll the dice one too many times now. It's all going to come crashing down. You know, I, I lift up the reality is if I lift up one refrigerator now, it that refrigerator might it just everything might pop. You know, that nerve will break, that ligament will break. I've got a frozen knee syndrome, which means that everything in my knee is damaged. Yeah. But it's not damaged bad enough that like I can't walk, but they're like everything, the, the ACL, LC, everything is a little damaged. So it's like Body's just now, falling either. apart. Yeah. Yeah. But if you push it, you're going to be in a wheelchair. So, for someone whose life has been up and down, penthouse to park bench, penthouse to park bench, um, and with my demons and with my issues and everything that's going on, I really I don't have a 401k. Um, I I could have prepared better for getting older, but surviving in and of itself was so hit and run for me. I mean, surviving for almost anyone now is. I mean, who saves for tomorrow in today's world? It's a miracle. It's a blessing. But then you add all the stuff I got 
And it's like, just the fact that I made it is, is, is a miracle. So have being, have being prepared, I just not, I'm not. And the way I survived was my body. And I have taken this thing to the limits of medical science. Yeah. So they literally don't know how I'm even just walking straight anymore. What? I said they what's literally something don't know how you can do that doesn't require your body or what what what's something where could you see yourself? What what would what would a good future for you look like? You know, well, not not moving, uh, you know, not working manual labor. What what does that look like? Honestly, you know, I have to accept and I'm not mad at it. I'm not I'm not upset at the idea. It doesn't necessarily bother me, but a humble living my one other skill, my one other thing beyond manual labor was my um, addiction counseling. But there are certain reasons that Florida is different from where I was certified. So I can't do that here. And that blew me out the water. I was like, oh, well, I could do that. I was like, damn it. Why, what else am I going to get going? So for me, you know, I could be an old dude just working the shop. You know, I could be that old cooter, you know, working that little wood shop somewhere, you know, small little, I, I, something simple to, to pay the bills, and I'm fine with it. I, my main thing is my wants at this point in life, I mean, I've lived it. You know, I've done the, the whole been on stage for a bit. I've had the gorgeous girlfriends. I've lived some life. I live more life than, than most people in some ways, worse life than a lot of people. But I've lived. And I'm okay with the fact that I've lived. Right now, if I could just have some quiet, small, peaceful little corner to call my own, definitely a, a little bit away from the, the neighborhood life. You know, I don't want to hear Pookie playing, playing that music three o'clock in the morning. Um, I mean, no one does, but especially me with PTSD and, and other issues, like it, that's why I went to the farm. Just, you know, like if I could get another camper that's actually mine and not one that's on ridiculous payments that I just, I may not be able to afford for a month or two. And then it gets repossessed, you know, just something small that's mine where I could bring stinkers. Maybe if there's, if, if I, you know, maybe if, if I have the space and, and means, I could bring in uh, another kitty or another rescue animal, and I could be living, work on my photography. You know, maybe bring in, you know, build that. I have a talent for it, actually, which is surprising. People like my work, so yeah, I've seen I, it. It's beautiful. I, who knew? Yeah, who you knew? do beautiful work. Even even the guy who actually taught me my first photography lesson just like six months ago saw one of my posts and was like, holy crap, like, how the hell did you go from when I met you to this? I was like, I don't know. He's like, you know, I'm awestruck. And this is from like a professional photographer. So I just need to get stability so that I can actually grow in that and, and maybe, you know, m make some art, get some some creative escapism and also you know just create things for other people and, and bring some money in i want to just have a nice quiet place where and a camp would be great because the thing about me living is i cannot live for just myself you know I don't, even if i am old and and beat up you know just me living for me is sort of kind of pointless like i don't really see the reason in it and it's not paying back all the people who help me like, if I'm saying, yeah, you helped me all these years, so now I get to sit and watch the prices right all day. Like, to me, that's so ungrateful, so selfish. You know, hey, thank you, God, for saving me from, from that broken back that could have had a cripple for life. Thank you for saving me from those muggers. Thank you for when I was protecting those old ladies from that guy with the razor blade that he didn't cut my throat. Thank you for all that. So now I'm just going to sit and eat tapioca pudding all day and and watch cat videos. It, it, just it's incredibly, incredibly selfish, ungrateful, and an empty existence. I I want to be able to collect food donations and, and medical donations for senior citizens with pets. 
Um, you know, a lot of our seniors, and, you know, I know this through Animal Rescue, a lot of our seniors are forgotten. A lot of our seniors who have raised children, who have raised families, who have been loving wives or husbands, who especially the men who worked, you know, 12 hour days for like the last 40 years and their thanks is to be left alone somewhere forgotten. All they have is a cat or a dog. That's their only source of love. And they're splitting a can of tuna fish from their care package because they can't really afford cat food. They can't. And this animal is the only thing keeping them alive. I want to be able to go and, and collect donations for them. I want to be able to help them say, hey, here's, here's a couple of 30 pound bags of food. Here's a case of cat food. I'll see you next month. You know what I mean? So I want to be able to go around and, and, and give back. I, I want to be able to feed the, the stray animals in the street that everyone's forgotten about. Have forgotten. Some of them were just thrown out. A lot of them thrown out by people who think animals will just survive. Well, they're wild animals. They're also, no, they're not. They're not wild animals, and this isn't the forest. You know what I mean? This, is, this isn't the forest. So, you know, I want to help the ones that are just forgotten, that are thrown out, that are that are barely surviving. So, you know, having just some small, simple space of my own where I can have my peace, where I can get back to my writing, because because I just like, and that's probably why I'm good at photography, because I used to be um, an excellent writer. I was really like chased after by some publishing companies, but then my madness took over and we all know where that got me. And, you know, I want to be able to finally write something of substance, something extended. And, and maybe it will be something that can make something beautiful of the horrors I've seen. You know, I, I am an old man. Um, and right now, I just, I want peace, but I want to be able to give back. I have to. There's no other purpose in, in me surviving. If I'm not saying thank you to the people who helped me survive this long by giving back to the world in some way, caring for those who have no one else to care for them. And it's also my way of apologizing for all the failures that I've had, for all the times I let my demons loose, uh, beat me, for all the times I asked my demons to beat me. Come on and take me on this drug run. Come on and take me on this psychotic run. Come on and, you know what I mean? I wasn't always the victim. Uh, I volunteered. I just, I, I don't want to die in, in a place of nothingness. You know, when, when this old body finally gives out, I want to at least be able to say that if for all the wrongs and all the failures, you know, at least I, I said thank you. I said, I'm sorry, and I tried to make life a little bit easier for those who have no one else to do it for them. Even one such as I, who lived in as great of darkness as I have, to find salvation and kindness. Veganism and Jesus showed me that, that the greatest weapon we have against darkness is kindness. And it doesn't mean niceness, it means kindness. Niceness is often empty bull crap. Kindness means actually doing something. To me, just trying to be kind is the only salvation there is. Maybe the journey of life isn't about necessarily becoming anything, but maybe it's more of a unbecoming of everything that isn't really us so that we can be who we were meant to be in the first place. Maybe that thought can apply not only to Malachi, but to a lot of us. It's something we face as we get older, gain wisdom. The ego of who we thought we were, or who we were supposed to be, dies if we're lucky. Maybe we're not that hard-working, successful business person we thought we were, or the perfect mother or father, we're not the athlete or the golden child or the black sheep. 
We're not addicted to drugs, ruled by vices, or as ugly as we were always telling ourselves we were. We're not the party animal, or the prude, or the person who has everything together, or the one who always messes everything up. We're not any of these things. And maybe we just need a chance, a little time and understanding, to prove the world otherwise. When we first started this series with Malachi, the idea of murdering Malachi was more of a figurative than a literal title. Someone who was trying to shed the person that abuse and mental illness, poverty, and drug addiction made him think he was. In the end, he's not really Malachi. He's just a man named Eric that grew up in Philadelphia in the 1970s. We've decided to start a GoFundMe for Eric with the goal of giving him an actual used travel trailer. Something with a proper bathroom and a small kitchen and a place to put it for a year. We figured we'd try to raise about $30,000 and that could get it done. If you've enjoyed listening to a story and would like to help out, you can check out the show notes for a link to the page or visit the redactedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. The Redacted Podcast is produced by myself, Matt Bender, and my wife, Pamela Bender. Make sure to go out there and give us a like, a share, share it with your friends, rate us. Every little bit helps. Thanks for tuning in.